three rather uh, more sober presentations, I assume. Um, the first is by Ken Wiwa. He and I are uh, stable mates now. We're both, we both have been uh, created senior resident fellows by uh, John Fraser at Massey College, so we're, we're neighbors. Uh, we've also appeared together between the covers in a book about uh, immigrants, by immigrants, and, uh, and we've appeared on a television show on the same subject. Uh, he splits his time between uh, Canada, Nigeria, between Toronto and Lagos. He grew up in Africa and in the United Kingdom and now has uh, made here his home. I want you to welcome Ken Wiwa, a global soul. Um, this is going to be very um, <clears throat> an interesting process for me because I've decided it's not very often that I actually speak to an audience um, just off the cuff. And since this is an ideas conference, I've decided basically <clears throat> to open up my head and uh, allow you to look in. Um, <clears throat> I often get comments that when I write at the Globe, um, when I write my column for the Globe, it reads as if I've just um, <clears throat> dashed it off. Uh, which sometimes is true, but uh, <laughs> um, often, obviously, there's a lot of reading that goes into it, and uh, there's a lot of preparation, which um, every Friday around about, actually around about now, <laughs> um, I, get, I, I, I have to produce 800 words. And it always strikes me, it always astonishes me that um, I might have an idea what I'm going to write about when I start off, but um, by the time, um, when the week starts, but by the time I start writing, um, I start off with an idea, and uh, I, very, I often end up somewhere where I, ne I, I didn't intend to go or I didn't expect to go. So um, I'm going to sort of try that, that process a little bit uh, here today. Um, <clears throat> what I'm going to talk about, when I was asked if um, I was received an email about two weeks ago, someone, um, the organizers said to me, would you like to bring any props? And I thought, well, I don't know what I'm going to talk about, so I couldn't really answer that question until I sat here um, this, this morning and I watched all these uh, presentations of people um, bringing up charts and PowerPoints and so on and so forth. And I thought I really should have some props of some sort. Um, and then it occurs to me that probably the, the, the prop that I would use uh, to illustrate what I'm going to talk about today would be my study, my library. Uh, which is now spread over uh, in three different continents and four different places. Um, so I guess it would have been a little bit, uh, they might have been surprised if I came up and said, look, by the way, can you shift my library from Massey College onto the stage? But um, what I actually did was in the intermission over lunch, I went back to uh, Massey College and I picked out the book which I think essentially illustrates uh, some of my thinking around uh, cultural issues. Um, and the book is the first prop here, is by uh, Mario Vagas Llosa, the storyteller. Um, and there's a story behind this, this particular copy of this book, which I'll probably, if I have time, I'll, I'll, I'll get onto that. But um, the other prop I have is what I'm wearing. Now, the reason why I'm wearing this is, um, well, given that I'm sort of uh, the odd man out in the three presenters today, I thought I'd better wear the prettiest dress. <laughs> but, <coughs> but essentially, the, uh, the, this is uh, it's called an Agbada. Uh, in Nigeria, it's worn, actually, it was worn in the north, uh, mostly. Uh, but you see it being worn everywhere now. And, uh, and the irony of what it is is that whenever I used to, <coughs> for me, it makes me feel sort of kind of authentic African at least uh, perhaps when you're looking at me, you see, uh, you see an African despite the, the sound that's coming out of my mouth, which uh, um, obviously sounds very English. Um, so in a sense, it gives me a sense of being more authentic when I wear this, when I wear this. And, uh, and I say that with a sort of smile on my face because I remember when I was um, traveling around the world, sort of talking to audiences, lobbying governments and people uh, on behalf of my father, um, he used to write letters, uh, at this time, he was, at that point he was, uh, he was in detention, he used to write letters to me and, he used, he, and I remember one letter he wrote to me and he said, when you make presentations, um, wear African clothes. 
And I thought this was the oddest thing for, for him to say. Well, I didn't think it was the oddest thing. It was very much in keeping with my father, who, who as you, you know, some of you probably know, named, him, named me after him. And uh, I fought this battle for a long time to try and escape his designs on me. But um, essentially, I think what, uh, what I deduced from that um, was that he was, he was perhaps concerned that here he was in detention in Nigeria. And I was traveling around the world, this very sort of uh, uh, anglicized uh, individual talking about his father, talking about my community. And maybe he felt an anxiety that people may, may think that I wasn't authentic, I wasn't the real, the real thing. And I guess that's kind of, <laughs> that kind of seeped into me because I've always sort of felt uh, um, um, that perhaps uh, my experience is not, uh, is not wholly an Ogoni one. I mean, I was born there and I grew up there and I still speak the language. And uh, in many respects, I feel, I feel I'm authentically Ogoni as the next man or woman. But um, um, so I guess wearing this uh, gives me a sense of being Ogoni. But of course, the irony, of course, is that this is not Ogoni traditional dress. Um, uh, <clears throat> what is traditional dress um, is a question which I've often pondered. One of uh, a Nigerian artist I know, Yinka Shonibari, does this thing with um, batik prints. And uh, I think so if, you, if you know batik prints, uh, <coughs> it's sort of, it's become this sort of very African um, dress. Um, but of course, the irony of batik is that it was, it was uh, invented in Indonesia. So for me, uh, all these kinds of thoughts inform my thinking about authenticity, about where culture comes from and how people, uh, <coughs> people uh, transcribe that culture. Um, <coughs> the, other <coughs> the other thing, I wanted to talk about the other prop I have actually is that um, I've decided to dim the lights uh, on the audience uh, <laughs> because as a uh, as a writer um, you're often I was often told that when you're writing one of the things that makes it easier to communicate your idea is perhaps to imagine a certain person that you're writing to imagine you're writing whatever you're writing as a letter um, <clears throat> now I've never found that that works I've always found that uh, I, I prefer just to address an audience, um, which is why when I'm up here speaking today, I, I decided to, to dim the lights because I don't want to look at you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but essentially, my story today is, is about culture. Uh, and my, 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 the, well, my tentative conclusion, um, as it were, about culture is that culture is a never-ending story. Um, that keeps, be, keeps being written and rewritten, created and recreated. Um, <clears throat> and um, I guess one of the things, um, when you talk about story, uh, one of the things that struck me earlier this week, actually, is, is this, this, uh, this story about the Treaty 8 First Nations and their tax exemption. I don't know if any of you have followed that story, but uh, uh, members of the Treaty 8, descendants of the Treaty 8 uh, um, have had applied to the court uh, to be exempt from t uh, federal taxes. And the Court of Appeal uh, rejected that claim um, this week. And, when I, and I think the verdict, what struck me about the verdict was, um, or the written submission from the Court of Appeal, was that uh, Treaty 8, the, the case had actually been, the, the judge, the trial judge last year had actually awarded, had actually granted uh, the Treaty 8 for, um, exemption from taxes. And he granted it based on oral submissions and testimonies from tribal elders, where they say they had been promised, uh, as part of this treaty, that they would be exempt from taxation. And the Court of Appeal essentially said that, uh, in their written submission, said that uh, the judge um, had crossed the boundary of legal evidence in, uh, in, in admitting um, oral testimonies. And I thought that was quite interesting, because <clears throat> um, <clears throat> As an Ogoni, um, I was brought up in an oral tradition. Our language is a very oral, it, it's not written, obviously. Uh, the language is a very musical language. Um, I, often talk, I, I often say that when you, when you have conversations in Ogoni, um, you're often singing to each other. And uh, there's a competition, there's always, often, it's a sort of call and response. There's often a competition between those who, when you're speaking to someone, to, to, to describe in the most lyrical way uh, your thoughts uh, and to communicate in the most lyrical way. And, um, and it's sort of ironic to me, of course, because, because um, 
I left Ogoni essentially when I was 10, and my, 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 my appreciation or my understanding of, of Kana, which is one of our languages, is, 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 was very much stymied at, as a 10-year-old. So my vocabulary is a 10-year-old's vocabulary. And, um, and I regret not being able to have that sort of that lyrical um, vocabulary um, that a number of my cousins, and, and whenever I go back to, to my community, as I do every three months, and I listen to the conversations, and I listen to the wonderful way they're able to express themselves. And I'm constantly frustrated because, as you, as you hear, I'm, I'm trying to write this book when I'm trying to capture some of that, uh, some of their speech patterns, some of those words, so that lyrical um, way of expressing ourselves. And it just doesn't really compute when you, <coughs> when you bring that oral tradition into a written form. Uh, certainly when you bring kana, translate kana into, into uh, English. I think uh, the word, the phrase is uh, something gets lost in translation. And, um, and so it's, it's become very sort of frustrating to me as I'm trying to conceive of how to, how to write this book, how to tell this story, uh, which essentially is a, 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 a history of my, of my community. And um, I suppose listening to some of the... Um, uh, listening to some of the speakers uh, earlier today, and, I, and everyone talked about music. And uh, it struck me as I was listening that perhaps uh, I should sing it. Um, I should write it down as, as verse. Um, <coughs> but my problem is, is that although I come from a very musical tradition, unfortunately, I'm actually tone deaf. <laughs> I'm the only one in my family um, of five children, um, or certainly from my mother's side, who has no musical ability whatsoever. I always say I'm the white sheep of the family. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um, <laughs> so I always feel like, I, you know, I always wish I could, I could actually sing this, sing this story. It would, make, it would make so much sense. It would probably allow me to access um, that wonderful uh, language that we have. But, um, well, my challenge is to, is to find a way to convey the history of my community um, in print, in English. And I don't think that uh, somehow anything is going to be lost in that. Um, but, but I guess that's the skill of, that's the, the, that's the challenge and the skill in, of me as a, as a writer. The story is called um, The Last Man. Uh, I came, I, the reason why I, I decided to call it that is because God in my community is a woman. Kawabari is our god. And in our mythology, in our creation myth, Kawabari gave birth to Benekwawa. And Benekwawa is, 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 is touted as the, as the founder of Ogoni. And Benekwawa, uh, one of the, there are several creation myths, but the one that I, uh, I increasingly subscribe to is that we came, Benekwawa came from Ghana with two, two, two women, two daughters, sorry. Um, I better just backtrack a little bit there. One of, the one, of, one of the reasons why I like to write things down is because you, your mind is so much more ordered. When you speak, <laughs> you, you do tend to uh, miss your, miss your uh, marks. But what I, what, I, what I wanted to reflect back to, that, to, to the oral tradition, um, the verdict in the Court of Appeal this week, was that the sense that somehow oral traditions don't have... Uh, I think what that verdict was hinting at was that oral traditions somehow are not as authoritative as as uh, written traditions, that somehow by writing it down, it makes it more, more factual than, than oral traditions, which have this, this aura of myth and folk tale, which is said to be sort of you know, artistic, uh, have artistic license and so on and so forth. So for me, The Last Man is, is, uh, is a book which is, half of it is true and half of it I've, I've, I've made up. Um, I'm just gonna give you a very brief uh, <coughs> outline of, of that, because I've, I've got six minutes there. I'm going to give you a brief outline of it, and uh, I won't tell you which bit I made up and which bit is true. As I said, Benekwawa gave birth to, um, um, had two daughters, came from Ghana, and <coughs> eventually settled in a place called, a, a village called Nama, which is the oldest um, Ogoni village, and it still survives today. In Nama, they cleared the, tree, they cleared the, forest, the surrounding forest and left one tree standing. And uh, whenever you go to Ogoni today, you'll see in every village there's a, there's a tree where the village congregates around. It's called the Tree of Life. And, uh, and when they cleared the forest, they, and there was one tree standing, and a community emerged in that space. 
And eventually, um, the community got so large, members of the community had to leave and uh, go and form other communities. So in that way, Ogoni um, developed from an east to west axis in, in, in a 20 by 20 mile sort of area, bounded by uh, rivers and um, our neighbors to the south, the rivers to the north and our neighbors to the south. So, and today there are about, uh, about 120 villages. And what's interesting about it is if you, you can still go back and see and hear the development, the trace of that, of that um, migration, because if you start with um, in Nama uh, and in a place called Bane, which is my home village, we speak Kana. By the time you get to the western end, they speak uh, <coughs> Gokana and Thai, which is fairly similar to, to, to Kana. But um, essentially, um, I can't really understand Thai. I can just about understand Gokana. They, they share a lot of similar words, but things, uh, you know, they say that every 18 miles a, di a dialect becomes a language. So there's a sort of a development along that east-west axis. Anyway, the story of the last man is about, a, <coughs> about um, um, a woman who goes, an English woman who goes back to, uh, who goes back to Ogoni. Um, doesn't go back to Ogoni, goes to Ogoni. And uh, what she's trying to do, I, can't, I haven't quite worked out whether she's a, she's a, a botanist or a, a writer yet, but anyway. She goes back to Ogoni because she's heard about this community which has died out and there's one, one man left standing. And, uh, and there's going to be a truth commission to establish why this community is about to die out. And, um, and so she goes back, her name, I, in, in the conception of it, I've sort of got her name down as Jane Doe, but uh, <laughs> I realize that names actually are important uh, in, in the conception of, of stories. So um, the name um, I decided to call her uh, at the moment is Jane Barry, and um, if I have time, you'll know why. Um, so Jane Barry goes back and is listening to, the, to this truth commission, to the proceedings of this truth commission, where this, the last man, the last surviving man of this community, tells the history of the community from the creation by Gbane Kwawa and Kawa Barry all the way down to, to himself. And, and he uh, tells a story which essentially uh, captures the reasons why I've always been, I've always wondered why my community is such a patriarchal society, um, but it's, it's, it's creation. It was by, by women. It's a matriarchal society. And why there was this transition from a matriarchal to patriarch, patriarchal society. Now, essentially, it happened because of war um, amongst the community. But anyway, so the last man tells his story, and he tells the story. And his submission, the truth commission, uh, hopefully is going to be in this very lyrical um, sort of song about the Ogoni creation myth and the Ogoni history. And um, at the Truth Commission, um, there's this one young man who's, who's um, <coughs> been working. He's an archaeologist of a sort. He's been working in this community. And uh, he has built this, he's inherited the last, stand, the last house standing um, in this community. And he's turned it into a sort of a museum, a monument uh, to the people. Uh, he's put up all the artifacts um, of, of the community. And uh, in it, there's this great library. Um, and in the library, he has basically, he's trying to write a history of the people, but in the language, uh, in the original language of the people um, of Ogoni. And uh, <coughs> so Jane Barry wonders, so they struck up a, a relationship. And Jane Barry wonders why this young man is so determined to write the story about these people who, uh, in this language, who only one person speaks. Um, <coughs> and he says, well, you know, that's the way it is. You write these stories, and who knows, one day somebody, may, this story might become somebody else's story. Um, and essentially, the story, what I'm trying to get at there is, is my thinking on la about language, that there's this sense that language, um, languages die. Um, and there's a great concern about languages dying. And for me, I've always, I've always wondered whether do languages actually die or do they become something else? Do they, like cultures, become another story? I've always looked at the English language, for instance. The English language, 90% of words in the English language come from another, cult, from another language. English has this ability to absorb other languages into itself and still retain the essence of being English. And I've always felt that perhaps that's the essential idea about cultural survival, that these cultures don't die, they just become absorbed into something else, and they become something else. So in a sense, um, 
in this, in this, uh, this story of, uh, between um, Jane Barry and this young man in the library, there's, this, uh, there's an argument about cultural survival. And um, <coughs> because I've only got 49 seconds, and you're going to have to read the book eventually if I ever get to write it, um, what happens is that, uh, well, uh, let me fast forward through. She has a baby with, with she has a child with, uh, with a young man in the library. Um, don't ask me why, it's immaculate conception anyway. Anyway, she's back, in, uh, she's back in England having this child, and when she has the child, she takes a look at the child, and, uh, and, it stri and as she looks at it, she decides to call the child Kawa Barry. So in a sense, the daughter is the last man. The community is reinvented, and so on and so forth. And I think I'm out of time. <laughs> How did I do? <laughs> Thank you. Oh, Ken, you're right. It uh, does something to a guy wearing a dress. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. <laughs>